Welcome to the Heart to Kill podcast, the official podcast of the Heart to Kill program, the world's leading program for driven individuals looking to gain direction and momentum, where we aim to break down the complex, multifaceted and holistic factors of human performance and optimization. Both on the program and on this podcast, we will be discussing and excavating everything pertaining to psychological resilience, physical robustness, and leading by example with discipline and tenacity to create a culture of winning, especially in the turbulent, frenetic, and high tempo world of the ambitious individual. This is Mark, the creator, senior DS, and head coach of the Heart of Kill program. Let's get stuck straight into it. Okay, so on today's episode of the podcast, what I actually want to discuss for the first time is a little bit about training, okay, and this whole concept of functional training um, that really leverage and look to utilize principles and pieces of equipment like the kettlebell, okay? Now, any of you who have followed me or listened to me for an extended period of time will know that I rarely ever talk about training, and there's a good reason and rationale for that. The truth is, it's rarely ever actually what's at fault in terms of when we look at active versus passive coping mechanisms, a lot of people tend to just gather information as a form of procrastination. Whereas often what I want to question is, well, how productive and effective and consistent are you being with the actual information you already have? And the answer to that is often not very. So piling on more information about training often exacerbates it and feeds into this this level of procrastination. But for the purpose of today's podcast, I do want to start to delve into the realms of of strength and conditioning um, in kind of a lightly applied touch, just looking at overarching high contour concepts of, you know, this, in my opinion, overuse, overglorification, and emotional attachment to functional quote-unquote training and utilization of, of tools. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the kettlebell, okay? So that's my kind of my rationale for not talking about training as much. But now when it simmers down to it, if I'm observing things that I feel potentially could be improved, if I'm able to to talk about my education and the experiences that I've had over coaching people for, for a decade now, and we're not just talking about anybody and everybody. In my 10-year career, I've worked with Olympians, I've worked with professional British superbike riders, right through to people who've gone on, multiple people who've gone on to pass special forces selection and multiple arduous courses. So I, I feel like I'm relatively qualified here to talk about this topic and discuss these concepts. Now, a lot of people like to talk about the white belt mentality and all that sort of stuff. You know, you constantly remain a student, whereas I like to approach this with what we call a blue belt mentality in terms of, you know, I've been a coach for 10 years. I've worked in the highest echelons of coaching and personal training. As I just alluded to, I've worked with professional athletes through to, you know, tactical athletes passing this, this single most arduous and selective course in the British Army and arguably in the world. So I understand and I'm accepting the fact that I do have experiences and I'm not going to create false humility here and say, oh, I know nothing. I know a little bit. I've made a lot of mistakes and that's kind of qualified and quantified me to know some things. I'm always questioning how I know what I know, always looking to refine and distill that and, and, and apply those in different ways. But, you know, ultimately today, I do want to talk about training and uh, to see if I can expand your understanding, to see if I can give you fresh perspectives and a new set of eyes on, you know, what is something that, that you may well be doing through three, six, 10 times per week in, in order to optimize that, to make you better, to expand and enhance your understanding. So obviously you can go on to uh, to become hard to kill. So with that out of the way, what I want to talk about is this concept of, of functional training, okay? I want to start with the first key point that is functional is a subjective term, okay? And on my social media, on Instagram, on all social medias, I'm seeing a resurgence of, honestly, blokes with floppy hair, no top on, fucking bare feet, swinging fucking kettlebells about and calling it functional, okay? Now, this is not determined to, to vilify anyone. It's not about being disrespectful. I'm just simply saying it as I see it and I'm, I'm telling you what I observe. And if you're listening to this, there's a high chance that you've probably observed the fucking same. And if you are truly in a white belt mentality where you're looking for the next thing and you want to connect the dots with a problem you have and you feel training might be the answer, then you'd be, you, you're probably going to lean towards looking into that and think, oh, is this the next thing for me? Should I be using kettlebells more? Why would I even not choose kettlebells? I do want to be more functional and functional is a sexy word like I get it because you know a vast proportion probably everybody that we work with in fact what aspires to have a degree of robustness and, and of lean muscle mass but can also move it extraordinarily well has great movement fidelity you know can be hill fit can also be strong in the gym can rope climb can can do a multiple of different disciplines extraordinarily well and I think that's what people are aspiring to when we look at the word functional but unfortunately that's again been marketed extraordinarily well um, and it's lost its meaning but 
understand that functional is a subjective term. So let's explore that, let's expand upon that. If you are an aspiring bodybuilder, then kettlebell swings, kettlebell clean and jerk, kettlebell largely anything is going to be the absolute epitome of non-functional for you. It'd be an absolute waste of time and energy. And if anything, it'd be sending the wrong signals from a, like a biomechanical and a biological standpoint for the adaptation that you want. So it would not be functional in any stretch of the imagination. If you're, again, an aspiring bodybuilder, highly isolated single joint movements are going to be very functional in utilization, obviously, with multi-joint compound lift to add to that as well. But yeah, single joint, like preacher bicep curls are going to be very functional for you. They're going to be show winning for you. They're going to allow you to do your sport extraordinarily well to the highest tier. Okay, so understand that functional is a subjective term. Whereas if we look at the tactical athlete, so an individual who needs to be robust, who needs to have fortified connective tissues, you need to have like good stability and mobility in the joint capsules. You need to have great like postural um, robustness, intersegmental stability, great work capacity, all those kind of things. The reality is that single joint isolated movements are not going to be particularly functional. There is going to be a time and place, you know, if we're looking to train the anterior tibialis or the front of the shin or the gastroc. There's a few, because um, there's, there's never really absolutes in strength and conditioning. There's a few times that it may be useful, but as a, an overarching generalization, it's not really going to be that useful for our tactical athlete to have fucking jack delts because he's been doing loads of lateral raises and, you know, cuffed cable work. That's just the honest truth. So first and foremost, going into it, understand that, that functional is a subjective term. Now, the second key point I want to make is that if you're training for fun, if you are only training because it's therapeutic and you enjoy it, then I can 100% understand the rationale behind wanting to do something like purely kettlebell training or purely functional training. Because it is fun. You get to swing shit around. It's new. It's exciting. It's novel. You get hot and fucking sweaty and all that sort of good stuff. Mega. But again, drawing and calling on my experience over the past 10 years and working with thousands of people, thousands of people in both a one-to-one -one capacity to your group setting and an online and, 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 and virtual capacity, I know from experience that if you don't start seeing progress, it stops being fun really pretty fucking quickly. Okay, as, as humans, especially as aspirational and driven and determined humans, we need to see performance increases. And that's why obviously we like to use training modalities in the Hard to Kill program that we assign key performance indicators to. And the KPI will be different depending on the individual. We very much believe in coaching the person, not the process. If we've got tactical athletes, depending on the course that they're going on or the arduous course or selection card or whatever it is, then we're going to engineer KPIs that are indicative of performance in those settings and environments. Whereas if you've got triathletes, you know, we'll look at data fields right from like running cadence through to swimming swath through to, you know, cycling cadence, VO2 max. You know, the KPIs have to be reflective of the individual and their aspirational outcome. Whereas when you're looking at swinging a fucking kettlebell around, like what's your KPI there? How heavy the kettlebell is? Again, like you're actually able to, because it's so multi-joint, it's so compound, there are so many things that can be changed and moderated in your technique and the speed and the velocity. Very, very hard to track that. So you could just be swinging it in a different way. You could be swinging it with higher velocity so you can move a different kettlebell weight. Like, you know, it's very, very hard to track. And as a result, what I tend to observe is that an individual will get into something like kettlebell training or functional training because it's fun, because it feels quite accessible, um, because there's an identity attached to it. They'll do it for a little bit of time and they realize that actually I'm not really making much progress. I'm starting to look like a bag of yogurt. I don't really feel like I'm getting much stronger. I'm not really much fitter. Yes, you might be more mobile. I will 100% concede on that. But the reality is you're not going to see much progress. That then starts starts to create friction, it starts to create frustration because your expectation was you were gonna look like this fucking jacked caveman on Instagram. Now you've been swinging a kettlebell around for three weeks and all you've got is blisters on your hands, bruises on the back of your wrist um, and a yogurt bod. And you're like, well, this hasn't met my expectation. So now I'm frustrated um, and it's no longer fun. Whereas if we actually were to use it sensibly and use it as a tool in our training repertoire alongside other modalities and other more effective mechanisms, then it will remain fun, so to speak. So the fourth key point, I want to touch on and it kind of carries on neatly from from that that latter point is that it is very very difficult to apply the kettlebell in a way that we would need to in order to actually see progress so without going into too much depth there are largely three mechanisms via which hypertrophy or stress kind of works from a training physiology standpoint and again i don't want to go into too much depth here but the, the one that we're primarily concerned with when we're looking at strength adaptation is what's called mechanical tension so very easy analogy if you are 
doing press-ups, okay, you're exposed to a certain amount of mechanical tension. Now, there's a maximal upper limit because your body can't suddenly gain 10 kilos in 10 seconds, okay? So that's the amount of mechanical tension that you are being exposed to. Whereas if we were to do like a barbell bench press, we can add more and more weight. So we can expose you to more and more mechanical tension. Now, as I've already alluded to with a kettlebell, it's very, very difficult for us to do that because yes, you can use a heavier kettlebell, but because it's largely a very ballistic movement, because you're swinging the fucking thing around, you're not actually being exposed to load for an enormous part of the movement. So let's pretend, you know, let's imagine that you're doing a kettlebell clean, okay? You're going to feel the load in the bottom of that movement. So you're actually experiencing mechanical tension there, brilliant. But all you're really doing is an isometric contraction with the muscles that are holding that kettlebell in place. And then you swing the fucking thing, okay? So you swing the fucking thing. And whilst obviously it's in motion, whilst it's, it has velocity, you're not actually holding, you're not actually under any tension whatsoever. Your body is not creating torque at all. And then you don't really press it. You just, you just catch it. So again, all you're doing is an isometric contraction in an overhead position, which again is great, as I've already mentioned, for overhead stability and mobility, but that could also be used in like a warm-up sequence or a warm-up matrix or a conditioning sequence in a well-articulated, intelligently thought out and programmed strength and conditioning program. It is not the program itself. It is a small proportion that may be used in it, but there's also any one of a dozen other ways that we could get that same adaptive response. So understand it's very, very difficult to apply mechanical tension and as a result actually see prog uh, progression or instigate progressive overload. Now there are other mechanisms of, of hypertrophy. So we've talked about mechanical tension. There is also one called metabolic stress and that's that feeling of you know when something's really burning. So if you were to do 10 bicep curls one week and the next week you've obviously improved your endurance capacity, your body uh, has adapted, you can now do 12 with the same load. Then what you're doing is you're, you're progressively overloading um, metabolic stress. So all those precursors, so those like, chemical signals are pulling in the muscle and they're, they're, they're creating adaptive responses essentially that's what it's doing it's, it's sending a signal because you're creating a stress and then you'll adapt and you'll get better at that modality the problem with that is where does it fucking end because let's pretend that this week you can do x amount of repetitions you can do 40 repetitions of a kettlebell movement next week you can do 50 the week after you do 60 where the fuck does that end before your session is five hours long and you do 3,000 reps of kettlebell swings okay it's very 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 difficult because the only continuum to progress in progressive overload is not just more reps or more weight there are a whole host of other things that we can look to progress and again if you're looking for an actual training outcome if you're looking for a deliverable kpi you're going to have to make a choice at some point do i want to stick to this modality which is a kettlebell am i emotionally attached to that or am i actually going to use another tool which might be more appropriate whether that be machines whether that be barbells dumbbells or it be any one of a number of other different modalities and this is kind of my point here at some point the people that are perpetuating kettlebell as this this snake oil this is magic elixir have part the other tools in the box and they've now just become emotionally attached to a single modality and it's very easy as i said to buy into that but it's not actually best in my experience it's rarely ever if ever best i can't think of many examples um where exclusive kettlebell trailing is best for the individual and and leading on from this key point number five is that i've tend to observe that people attach an identity to kettlebell training and they do everything is kettlebell based so it's kettlebell gorilla rows and the kettlebell clean and press and everything is kettlebell based and then you'll observe various individuals on their social media videos just over engineering and trying to make things slightly different and it is not the fault of the consumer so it is not the fault of the client it is not the fault of the individual and the person who is uh, consuming this information because it looks new it looks novel I, I totally get it you know once upon a time I, I wasn't born with this level of knowledge and uh, once upon a time I would have thought oh, okay this looks really cool this looks different this is fine I'm going to try this but, you know, again, I've been through decades of frustration of trying these, these novel ideas that people have become emotionally attached to and realized that they just don't work. They are just and more often than not potentially uh, trying to sell a program or trying to sell a product, trying to sell identity, trying to sell a way of thinking. And, you know, I've seen videos of people doing like side bicep curls to tricep extension. Okay, when did it become bad? If you need that adaptation, when did it become bad to do dumbbell bicep curls? Oh, because that's a bro lift? Oh, because, you know, that's not functional? Well, actually, if for whatever reason you need to be strong in bicep flexion or sorry, elbow flexion or elbow extension, then I would argue it's extraordinarily functional for you to be getting stronger there. And do you want to do it the way that is pandering to your emotional attachment to a ball of metal? Or do you want to do it the optimal way? For me as a coach through 10 years of human optimization, I want to do it the optimal way. I want to do it the way that gets that person improved performance and a result as quickly as fucking possible. 
So if I need to program bicep curls, I'm going to program bicep curls. You know, we see this a lot with grapplers and stuff like that. If you're in a sport whereby you can lose by having your joint hyperextended, then it makes an awful lot of sense for us to fortify and hypertrophy the connective tissue by spending time in the extremity of that range. So if I program an incline bench bicep curl with a slow tempo, it's not just because I want you fucking jacked and swole. It's because I want you holding heavy load at the extremity of the range and learning how to safely be there and initiate contract and express force from there and that is 100 functional whereas if you're just swinging a kettlebell around because that's you know because that's kettlebell training that's functional actually you're going to have a suboptimal subpar second rate stimuli and stress and adaptation solely because you're emotionally attached to a modality and to a piece of equipment which i think fundamentally is wrong and you know as doing what i do in the hard to kill program what i actually want to do is ensure that people are as educated as possible so that you would never need another coach again and so you can become your own your own coach now this does go both ways i want to make sure that i am fair to all parties so point number six this does go both ways um you will or you will see a lot of people who are zealots for for the kettlebell methodology and for the kettlebell way of life and they have attached their identity to that they're floppy hair no t-shirt bare feet it's normally wearing like fucking weird ass shorts or vibram five finger shoes and all that sort of good stuff and you'll know them yeah if you're listening to this i'm kind of talking tongue in, tongue in cheek i'm not vilifying anybody you know i'm a walking fucking stereotype myself so i'm okay with that i'm not vilifying anybody i'm just identifying i'm just observing and i'm just calling a spade a spade but on the flip side of this you know you'll also see that the barbell crew as an example people who are i'm not going to lie normally pretty fucking overweight relatively unhealthy and they belong to barbell clubs and they're power lifters and they believe that the barbell is is uh, has superpowers and that if a lift is not done with the barbell it's not really lift it has to be a variation of a squat bench deadlift that is the primary modality and that is the king of all modalities and, and the barbell is better because x y and z and normally these people will throw an awful full amount of, of cherry picked research and literature at you about you know emg data studies and uh, like and, and, and fucking studies and research done on, on the outcomes testing those modalities and they are absolutely right those modalities are phenomenal at creating certain outputs and, uh, and, and certain, uh, producing certain ad- adaptation of an athlete and what i'm here to say as a coach uh, as a, a non-emotionally biased as a non-invested third party is yeah you're right these are incredible modalities so why don't we use all of them why don't we use all of them in the necessary irrelevant and applicable settings so that we get the best of all these things rather than just setting up camp like okay we're barbell people now let's grow a beard smell like a fucking ginster's pasty wear a fucking gopping t-shirt and just deadlift five days a week and take three hours to do so eating fucking crispy creams in between uh, and you know let's avoid that and let's also avoid being the kettlebell people who do everything in bare feet call everybody dude uh, and swing stuff around and talk about how functional it is you know why don't we why don't we just just not attach an identity to these things why don't we not attach emotional affinity to them and take a little bit from all of these schools of thinking uh, and we can literally cherry pick the, the best way to stimulate these modalities because ultimately it's all about getting better but i just want to make sure that i i essentially fairly have a pop at everybody uh, and i'm expecting a lot of shit coming my way off the back of this but it is said tongue in cheek there's no genuine offense um off the back of this but you know i want to make sure that we understand that now moving on to point number 10 well, what is my personal standpoint? Well, my personal standpoint is that getting globally strong is never flawed. So as we've spoken to in earlier points and early key points, you know, there is very, very little capacity for us to generate mechanical uh, tension or to progressively overload or, or linearly periodize the kettlebell work. You know, it, and just, it has to be more repetitions or if you want to use more load, it's very difficult to actually track that because are you moving differently? You know, because there's so many, there's so many links in the chain. Um, it, it's very very, very hard for us actually track if we're moving differently without using quite high-end software that looks at your movement patterns and movement uh, physiology to see if we're doing exactly the same thing as you'll see in Olympic lifters. You know, so if you look at Olympic lifters that are very good, uh, I recommend following Sonny Webster on, on Instagram. He, he's phenomenal. He doesn't know who I am at all, but I followed him for a period of time and I think his page is fascinating. He's one of the best in the world at what he does in terms of actual output and also coaching people to do the same. And, you know, he uses a software that tracks the, the barbell path so he can see through repetition, 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 and he can meticulously improve that it's very 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 difficult to deal with the kettlebell and ultimately because there's not really a competitive stage for kettlebell sports or well, there may be um but i'd argue not to the same effect as, as olympic weightlifting because it's not a competitive stage there's not really the same amount of energy invested in tracking perfection with that but my personal standpoint is that getting globally strong
strong is never flawed. So what I mean by globally strong? Well, globally is referring to strong in all movements, okay? So there are only a handful of actual fundamental human movements, and that's obviously a horizontal push-pull, a vertical push-pulls. We've got hinges, squat patterns, and gates. Uh, when we say gait, we're talking about like gait mechanics or walking mechanics, like lunges, for example, as opposed to, but not necessarily lunges, I take that back. I'm um, looking at things like carries, so farmers carries, offset carries, overhead carries, and stuff like that. Those are really the things that we need to get good at. And when you look at it through that lens, you realize there's only actually so many lifts that can be done. Now, obviously, there are derivations of these lifts, and those are appropriate when we look to regress or progress those lifts. So, you know, let's take the deadlift as a fantastic example. If you're very new to deadlifting, we would want a pretty early regression of the deadlift. So we might opt to use an elevated trap bar deadlift just to get you used to hip hinging, just to get you used to actually how that movement feels and moving load through the chain. We might progress you to a rack pull. Then we might progress you to, um, you know, a conventional barbell deadlift from Brox. And then we might look at a Romanian deadlift. Then we might look at actually pulling from the floor. So there's so many derivations. And then when we're looking at how you're progressing through that, we're going to identify the weakest link in the chain. And something I'm synonymous with in the Hard to Cure program is saying that I'm only interested in the weakest link in the chain. The weakest link in the chain is the most important one because that's one that's going to fail. So we need to identify it quickly and then look at how we can improve it, how we can fortify it, how we can make it more robust. And we repeat that process in a cyclical manner using an OODA loop. So, you know, let's pretend we're looking at your deadlift and it's progressing over weeks and months. And then we notice, oh, okay, you're a little bit weak in this portion of the deadlift. And it's important that we're not because X is your outcome. So then we can start to look at other variations okay so we want to be get better in that final stage of hip extension because you're a bit weak on your lockout and the deadlift okay fantastic now what variations of this hip extension pattern do i have that could make you stronger in that end range of your deadlift well what about a hip bridge brilliant okay so now let's pick an appropriate regression or progression of the hip bridge that works for you based on you as a person and this situational consideration about where you are as a training athlete as in, your, in your training age well you know progressing right to the the end of like i don't know single leg or b stance heavy barbell hip thrust is it, probably a, a huge mistake because you can't coordinate that movement yet from you know sort of a motor perspective and you also might not have the, the necessary global strength to not break down technically so we'll regress it and Let's look at, okay, we're going to look at like a bilateral body weight hip thrust. Okay, we could even look at here, dare I say it, a kettlebell swing to in increase the speed and velocity at which you're hitting that peak contraction and getting end range um, hip extension. Okay, again, so we can use it. I'm not anti. It is a tool that is available for our facilitation to get the outcome that we want. But this is like, this is high contour overarching thought processes about how we should all aspire to approach strength and conditioning. And this is something that I was taught, you know, over my career by people that are far smarter and continue to be far wiser and at the, at the very forefront and the very very pioneering edge of strength and conditioning. And this is actually something that I was taught, uh, touching on, on a point here, back when I studied um, in Florida. So I went to a course called the MI40 um, Muscle Hypertrophy Camp. And, and many of you may be familiar with that, especially if you come from the coaching world. And I learned hands-on firsthand from Ben Pakulski, from the hypertrophy coach, so Joe Bennett, uh, Coach Kasim Hansen, who you know, now runs N1, um, some immensely bright and intelligent individuals. And they actually used a quote from the Matrix in terms of how we think about this. If you've seen The Matrix, this is going to make sense. If you haven't seen The Matrix, first and foremost, what the fuck are you doing in your life? Secondly, your homework off the back of this podcast is going and watch The Matrix. And thirdly, in the meantime, I'd like to bear with me. So there's a scene when Neo goes to see the Oracle and there's a kid sat there bending spoons with the power of his mind. And Neo said, how are you doing that? And the kid replies, well, you've got to understand there is no spoon. So this is a very tenuous concept, but when it comes to training, understand there is no spoon. So when we are lifting, when we are conscious contracting muscle, moving into your next session, I want you to forget about whatever's in your hands. Irrespective of whether that's dumbbells doing a dumbbell bench press, irrespective of whether it's an easy EZ bar doing barbell, uh, like easy bar bicep curls, irrespective of whether it's a barbell doing an overhead press or a deadlift, I want you to forget there is anything in your hands. And all I want you to do is contract muscle in the movement pattern and watch the bar fucking move on its own, okay? This is the best way to generate internal focus or what we call neuromuscular contractions. So, you know, 
whenever you look at people that are swinging load around like a kettlebell or just yanking bars like a powerlifter, um, th- there's very little internal focus there. It's just external focus, i.e. move the bar, push my feet into the floor and move the bar. But in order to get really, really good as a trainee, as an athlete, you have to be able to learn to initiate and contract muscle tissue. And this is one uh, this is one quote that was really breakthrough for me, is understanding that there is no spoon. Because all that muscles do, and this is my next key point, all that muscles do is generate rate torque which creates bone motion so if we're to look at the, the bench press as an example imagine that i'm at the bottom of the bench press okay and i've got my bar and i'm about to start pressing it i'm going to remember that there's no bar in my hands the bar is irrelevant i'm not thinking move bar from point a to point b what i'm actually thinking is i want to initiate you know my pecs okay and all i want to do is i want to bring the inside of my bicep to touch the inside of my chest. So all I'm doing there is I'm creating bone motion. Again, we won't go too much into biomechanics here of, of what that bone motion is, but all I'm doing is I'm approximating my humerus to my rib cage. Okay, and again, I'm not going, I'm deliberately not going into too much depth here, but that's all I'm actually doing is I'm moving those bones and it's the contraction of contractile tissue of skeletal muscle that is doing that, it's creating torque at the shoulder girdle and that is approximating that. That is all that we're actually looking to do when it breaks down to it. So what is in our hand is fucking irrelevant. If all you're thinking is move from point A to point B, then you're actually losing some of that stimuli. Now, there's kind of a gray area here because yes, we do want to move it as quickly as possible and the EMG data shows and the studies show that the intent is everything. So the the if you say to yourself, move this bar quickly, that actually creates creates more force, more power, more output than if you don't say anything, but we still have to be able to learn to contract that, okay? Um, so yeah, understand that all that muscles do is generate torque, which creates bone motion. So again, bringing it back to the core point of why kettlebells like are not the golden, the, the holy grail. Well, you know, what, what is the actual intent of using it? I've given a great example here, of, okay, if we want to improve your capacity and the speed and power which you lock out the top of the deadlift, we could use a kettlebell swing to facilitate that. That's because I know the bone motion, I know the adaptation that I want and where I need to create torque and how I need to improve the system. So I'm using it appropriately. If you're just swinging it around, what are you hoping to create? What was your intent there? So yeah, that, that's pretty much that's pretty much today's podcast. I want to make it very, very clear that I was not out to vilify or attack anybody with the kettlebell school of thought or the barbell school of thought, as, as I've alluded to. It is simply for me just about arming and equipping and resourcing anybody and everybody who listens to this podcast with the best information I possibly can, presented in a way that I really, really hope um, is user friendly. And I'd really value your feedback here because obviously I, I, I want to know has this been useful for you? Has this been a pick, applicable? This is the first time I've actually spoken quite openly about strength and conditioning and the little few bits that I. I know in the experience and education that I've got in an effort to help kind of the masses, quote unquote, because I simply want to see more people learn how to coach themselves, how to get better and how to maybe not subscribe to other people's modalities, but explore their own and have that that resilience and that curiosity to ask, well, what happens if I'm to do this? And what if I take that information that's come from Mark at the Hard to Kill program and I apply it to this, can that make me better? Can I get more resilient and robust? Can I fortify this system? Can I get stronger? Can I get stronger as well as getting fitter? And that's very much the aim, intent and purpose of everything that we do here in the Hard to Kill program. And, you know, in this episode specifically, helping you understand the modalities of training and where kettlebells are maybe applicable, but the overarching concept has very much been that there is more to it that meets the eye and I just want to see you get better so guys I would really really appreciate feedback on this if you're listening to it feel free to drop me a DM on our Instagram if you don't follow me on Instagram um, then please do I'd really appreciate that so we can have a bit of a conversation I always value hearing what it is you want to learn more about what it is that you have in the ways of curiosities and questions and things you want clarified and feedback is fucking ammunition for me okay I never take offense uh, to to critical feedback because actually that's what's going to allow me to get better and refine and distill and help people to improve so guys really really appreciate you for listening today chat soon Thank you.